Welcome to Leesburg Online. We're so glad that you chose to tune in with us. I hope that you will sing along with us. I want to welcome you as you join us again this week uh, here at Leesburg Christian Church. We certainly want to welcome you uh, to our service. I, I do want to remind you that we do have on-campus services each week on Sunday morning at 9.45 and 11.15 as usual. But we have added a new service on Sunday evening at 5.30 p.m. Uh, we've done this in order to provide as much safety and social distancing as we can during this time and and we want to encourage you to come back and 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 maybe if you haven't been to church for a while to come back at this time and join us as we uh unleashed that service this past week and and we had a good response to it and we anticipated to grow any even further and we're excited about it so if you have any questions feel free always to contact us uh either through our facebook page or um, by calling us or an email we'd love to hear from you about anything and also with regard to any questions you may have about the study that we're going through presently as we continue our endeavor uh, going through the book of Revelation. 
Uh, we uh, are, are so glad to, to, to do this and to share with you, and, and I think in such a pertinent uh, f form and fashion as, as talking about some of the issues that weigh heavy on our hearts today as we, most of us have an innate sense that there's something going on in the world, that something is changing, that it's headed towards something. And of course the scripture teaches us that absolutely th it is. And so today we come to Revelation chapters 8 and 9. Now, as I welcome you to Revelation 8 and 9, I, I believe it helps us to answer a question that people have really been asking for a long time, particularly since World War II. And the question is, is will the world someday be destroyed uh, by a nuclear war? I've been asked that question many, many times throughout uh, my ministry. And I think it's a relevant question for us to consider because of particularly what's going on in the world with, with Korea, North Korea, and Iran uh, in recent years. And so I know it weighs heavy on a lot of people's minds. It's interesting to me that nuclear capability that is available in our world today would be able to actually destroy the world about 17 times over. Uh, I looked it up to make sure I had the recent numbers uh, this week. There are roughly 15,000 uh, nuclear warheads available to a, to a, a, a myriad of, of countries today that used to not possess those. Now, the, the thing about it is, is that if we do not sometime in the future have a nuclear war, it would be the only weapon ever invented that has never been used on a mass or a wide scale. So the odds are not in our favor that it would never be used. Well, the, here's the good news according to what we read in Scripture. The good news is, is that the world will never be completely destroyed by a nuclear war. And we'll, we'll talk about the reason why. Because the world belongs to God, and God is going to be the one who ends this thing. However, the bad news is, particularly according to what we're going to read today, there is strong evidence that there will be a nuclear war, particularly in the tribulation uh, period. Let me begin by reading you a passage from 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 3. Peter warns, most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, we've talked about this before, mocking the truth, following their own evil desires, and they will say, what happened to the promise of Jesus coming again? And they will deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago, and that he brought the earth out of water, and he surrounded it by water, and then he used the water uh, to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same world, this uh, word, this present heavens and earth, have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything in it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives should you live? This is the big question for us. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along on that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, as he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. Now, prior to God completely cleansing the earth and starting over, we are told in Revelation that there is going to be a fiery devastation on earth brought by the evil domination of whom we have already seen unveiled for us in Scripture as the Antichrist. Now, Ezekiel, uh, the prophet in the Old Testament, describes this invasion coming from the north. And I'm not going to read you all that Scripture, but you can find that in Ezekiel chapters 37 and 39. But indications from Ezekiel and from other passages in prophetic writing is that the leader of this invasion is going to actually come from a northern kingdom. In the Old Testament, we're known, it's known as Gog of, of the land of, of Magog. And most Bible scholars, almost all of them that I have read, agree that this is pointing toward the land or the, or the country of Russia. And it's interesting today for us to note in the world political view the relationship that Russia now has been developing in recent years, particularly with Syria, Iran, and China, countries which are very hostile to the nation of Israel. So just keep that in mind moving forward as you keep your eye on world politics and watch the news. Now the seventh seal, which we're coming to today, is a seal of conflict. And it has two parts, seven trumpets and seven bowls. And there are three responses that we see here to the seventh seal. First of all, we're going to see silence and then we're going to see supplication. I'll explain what that means in just a moment. There's a prayer. 
and then there's going to be a sounding. So first, let's look at, at, at silence. In a couple of the Old Testament uh, prophet writings, Habakkuk chapter 2 and Zechariah 2, they speak of a time when the world will be silent before God. But this silence that we're seeing here as this chapter 8 unfolds is not a silence on earth. It's actually in heaven. Now, that's interesting because heaven has always been a very noisy place, according to the scriptures' description of what the presence of God is like. Angels praising God, rejoicing over the lost being saved, as we know from scripture, prayers being heard. However, as chapter 8 opens, there is a silence in heaven for a half an hour, depicting the seriousness of the judgment that is about to come upon the earth. So the Lamb of God, Christ, breaks the seventh seal. Verse 1 of chapter 8. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about a half an hour. And then the action resumes, verse, 20, verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given the seven trumpets. I emphasize the word thee because it says these seven angels. And it, evidently there are angels, and we talked about there's a high, hierarchical order of angels in heaven. There are special angels that have access to the presence of God, and they're standing. Their job was to carry out God's bidding. We have indication that Gabriel, for example, as we learned about in Luke chapter 1 during the birth of Christ, may have been one of them. Luke 1, 19, then the angel said to him, them, I am Gabriel, I stand in the very presence of God. It is he who has sent me to bring this good news to you. So Gabriel was an angel that stood in the presence of God. So why are they giving these trumpets? What's that all about? It's interesting that the trumpet was actually the most important instrument in the Bible or the most frequent instrument that is mentioned. It was the declaration of war. It uh, brought the assembly of God's people together. It also the announced the arrival of a king, which is what all this is setting up toward as Jesus is getting ready to begin his millennial reign. So here it is a proclamation of judgment as well as saying, uh, all, the, all the other stuff that will begin to take place. Now, before they blow the trumpets, there is an intermission of prayer. This would be the supplication. Let's look at verse 3 of chapter 8. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. A great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, mixed with the prayers of God's holy people, ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. This is a direct reference to the Old Testament tabernacle worship and the duties of the priest. This angel here has a priestly ministry, which is why a lot of people think this could be a description of Christ himself. Sacrifice had to be made on the brazen altar. He would pick up the coals, uh, put them in a censer, go to the holy place, mix the hot coals with incense before access to God in the tabernacle worship could be granted. In other words, sin has to be dealt with before access can be made. Now we know from the study of the scripture that we have access through Jesus and as a result, God hears our prayers. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. Verse 4 also talks about the prayers of God's holy people. These are the saints. This is also expressed in Revelation 6, 9, and 10. So God hears the prayers and he is about to avenge. Now we know from Scripture that Christ is our mediator, which is why we do not have to go to an individual or a priest in order to confess our sins. Christ is our mediator and our intercessor to God, which is why when we pray, we finish our prayers, if you'll notice, in the name of Jesus Christ. I only mention that because I want to remind you that you have direct communication to God and that God hears your prayers. Now, he may answer yes, he may answer no, he may answer wait, but God hears your prayers. And in his timing, in the way that is in your best interest, God will answer your prayer. The, the scripture teaches us that the Prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. So don't ever quit praying. Verse 5. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down on the earth, and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. 
This is a scripture that kind of reminds us of the two aspects of Christ. Either Christ is our Savior or he's our judge. Let's continue to read a scripture that's going to show us the detail of that. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 26. Dear friends, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. We can't continually beg off on grace. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses in the Old Testament was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which has made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit that brings God's mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge, I will pay them back. He also said the Lord will judge his own people. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a, of a living God. So there we have this idea of silence and what is about to be unleashed. And then we have the sounding of a trumpet. Revelation uh, chapter 8 verse 6 reads like this. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blast. And we're, I was reminded immediately when I read this of what actually transpired in an Old Testament as kind of a, a foretaste of this to come. And by the way, let me just remind you that whenever you're reading the Old Testament and if you feel like it's boring to you, if you will read it through the eyes and through the mindset of all of it pointing to Christ, which is what we're learning in this series going through the book of Revelation, you will be much more willing, I believe, to it may be endure what you think are kind of crazy old stories because what they are actually doing is pointing to this, what we call the blessed event and hope of Jesus' return. For example, I was reminded of the story of Jericho where they were commanded by God to have seven days of marching. On the seventh day, seven priests blew seven trumpets and that's when the walls fell and the people of Israel were able then to make their way through uh, Jericho into the promised land. Here in our passage, we have seven angels blow seven trumpets seven times in the 70th week to bring judgment on earth. All of that was a foretaste of what is yet to come. Now, I believe, according to this passage and many others, that this is a judgment we're about to see that is brought on by man and allowed by God to show man ultimately the principle that we talk about and have talked about many times uh, here at Leesburg and, and in other places. And that is the reap and sow uh, principle. You are going to reap what you have sown. You cannot plant something and reap something else. And God is demonstrating here that when sinful uh, nature has been sown and sown and sown and sown, that the reap, reaping of that will be nothing more than destruction. Now, I believe that man experiences what is described here, and you're going to hear it for yourself, what is best depicted as a nuclear holocaust at, a, at, at this particular point as God is preparing to purify the earth once and for all. So let's read it together, and you see what, how you feel about it. Verse 7, the first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down into the earth. Now listen. One-third of the earth was set on fire, and one-third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. In other words, what's happening here is God is beginning to reverse the curse through acts of man, uh, uh, so God judges the land for the sin of the people, the evil. Then the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One-third of the water in the sea became blood. One-third of all the living things in the sea died. And one-third of all the ships in the sea were, were destroyed. So God brings judgment upon the sea. That is actually probably brought by man himself. Now, we do not know what exactly this is. Is this a meteor that he's describing? Is it a, is it a nuclear or an atomic weapon or bomb or something? We don't know. But what we do know is this, that it affects one-third of the sea. Now, if you know anything about the earth itself, then you know that's a big territory because most of the planet is covered with water. Verse 10, then the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. 
and it fell on one-third of the rivers and on the spring waters. So God judges the fresh water supply. All a man's resources are being judged, and the fresh water is being polluted. Hosea chapter 4 verse 3 reads like this, That is why your land is in mourning and everyone is wasting away. Even the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea are disappearing. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 3 reads like this, I will sweep away people and animals alike. I will sweep away the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. I will reduce the wicked into the heaps of rubble and I will wipe humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. Isaiah chapter 2 also speaks of this same thing. However, with all the destruction that man's bringing upon himself, God is not going to permit man to totally destroy himself because it's not man's to do, although he will bring judgment upon himself. You know, I think it's interesting, and I've taught on it many times as we're talking about the polluted waters here, that Jesus, when he walked the planet and had that encounter in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well, he, he made a statement to her, which is relevant for you, and that he said, I came to bring you living water. There's something more important. There's something bigger than anything that you can partake here at this particular well. And I would say that is true for you and I as well. So we come to Revelation 8, beginning with verse 11. Now, if you want to read a, um, a parallel passage of Scripture, I would encourage you to read Jeremiah 23. I actually read it just a few moments before I presented this message here to you uh, today. But in Revelation 8, beginning with verse 11, it reads like this. This event that happened that we just read about in verse 10 and following, it made one-third of the waters bitter. And many people died from drinking the bitter water. We have an Old Testament story about the waters at, at Marah, if you remember, that were bitter and, and made fresh. And, 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 and here we're seeing a kind of a, a reverse of that. Then a fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, and they became dark. Well, how could that happen? Sounds a little bit like a nuclear fallout to me. And one-third of the day was dark, and so one-third, and also one-third of the night. So whatever your imagination would lead you to believe that this is, and the exact cause of it, chaos is judgment on man because of his misuse, I think, of time. With the earth being black, time is going to be confused. You're not going to be able to tell day from night. And in my opinion, this is the judgment on man who has said they have no time for God. Do you have time for God? Verse 13, then I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, terror, terror, terror to all who belong in this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. It's going to get worse. Now, as a side note, we know that, and I use the phraseology, if you will, many times that we live in a dark world. And there is uh, a segment, certainly, of our world and society that loves darkness. And so God is going to give man what he's been looking for and longing for all along, which is actually what hell is. You don't want God. You want to kick God out of your life. You want to be separated from God. And hell is going to be an eternity separated from God. And so here with the darkness, man is just giving, or God is just giving man exactly what he's longed for. Darkness uh, stepping away from his light. John chapter 3, we learn that the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. And who do the evil, all who do evil, hate the light and refuse to go near it, for their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light, so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Another great parallel passage in your personal study would be Romans chapter 1 that talks about their futile hearts become darkened in the last days. So we come to Revelation chapter 9. Now i got to tell you, this is a terrifying passage, and I, I'm not smiling or laughing because it's terrifying. I, I, I'm, I'm so humbled by it, I, I really don't know how to relate. I am going to share it with you. I want to read it to you. This is the middle of the outpouring of the judgment in the middle of the tribulation. And there's two purposes that I want to remind you of this tribulation. To judge the ungodly who refuse him and the redemption of Israel that accepts him. 
and any Gentile that may do that also. Now, all the judgments of the tribulation are described by the opening of these seven seals. Seals were on this scroll. Remember, we talked about that, Revelation 6. And the Lamb opens it, the Lamb of God, Christ, opens them one by one. And as this title deed to the earth is completely unrolled, declaring that the earth belongs to Christ. Once the seventh seal is finished, then God uh, will, uh, through Christ, will take control of this earth as Christ will set up his own kingdom. So we're, we're seeing the, and coming to the seventh seal. Now this is important to understand. The seventh seal is actually divided into seven parts called trumpets. And so the seventh trumpet then, you have the pouring out of the seven bowls of wrath. So literally there are 14 parts to the seventh seal. Now we've already seen the first four trumpet blasts in chapter 8. There's judgment on the land and the sea and the fresh water, the sun and the moon and the stars. One third die as God withdraws his creation while reclaiming earth. And now we come to trumpets 5 and 6 and they are in rapid fire succession. And these three trumpets, unlike the first four, are called woes because they are getting progressively more terrible. So we come to verse uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, as I already read to you. Then I heard a single eagle crying, terror, 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 to all who belong to, to this world because of what had happened in the last three angels blow their trumpets. So God is warning how bad this is going to be because he warns us because he's a merciful God. Why would he do that? Why would he give us this warning? Because he wants us to repent. Because love always warns. You know, in the scripture, it's interesting that there are over 600 warnings about judgment and about hell. God doesn't want hell for anyone. So he gives 600 plus signs saying, this is the road that leads to death. Stay off this path. And by the end of the scripture, we come to the conclusion that if we do not choose God, then we have no one else to blame but ourselves. Unfortunately, we are also told by God's word, though, that narrow is the way, and few find it. Broad is a path that leads to destruction. And what we're seeing here is that in spite of the warnings, many, many people, the majority, will not follow God. So in chapter 9, we have three wo woes and three blasts of the trumpets. The first four were on the physical world. The next two kind of go beyond the physical world. And hell is literally unleashed on earth as we see Satan and his demons working directly on earth in an unprecedented way. The first woe is found in verses 1 through 12. And here, the pit is unlocked. Well, let's read this together and then we'll talk about it for a moment. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky. And he, that's important, was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. When he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace, and the sunlight and air turned dark from the smoke. Then the locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or the plants or the trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them. I told you that it was going to be very difficult to be a Christian and a Christ follower during this time. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, and they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. They look like uh, what had gold crowns on their heads and their faces like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron, and their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing to battle. Some people have said this could be the description of, of, of possibly of mass uh, air war that would be going on, bombers and so forth. Uh, I beg to differ with that, but we'll see. Verse 10, they had tails that stung like scorpions, and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. In the, his name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek, Apollyon, the destroyer. The first terror was passed, but look, two more terrors are coming. According to Revelation chapter 6, verse 13, we learn something. 
we learn that the literal stars in the heavenly places have fallen. In chapter 8, verse 10, there's a great star, as we just read, that falls on the waters. We don't know what that is, some kind of meteor or whatever. But now, this star that is mentioned here in chapter 9 is different. This is not a mass. It's a person. He has a personality. It's referred to with a personal pronoun, he. I want to remind you that Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 and following, talk about this he. I want you to listen to this description. How you have fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to the heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of dread, down to the lowest depths. I read that to you because I want you to understand the description of the he that we have mentioned in chapter 9 is actually Satan himself. And he's being given limited power as he was actually from Eden on. In other words, I want you to understand some of the characteristics of Satan. He can tempt, but he cannot overcome. He can afflict like he did Job in the Old Testament, but only for a season. And we know that Job was uh, rewarded doubly. He can persecute, but he cannot uh, destroy in terms of the way that God has the power to do so. And we are also told that even though he can persecute, that God can take all things, Romans 8, 28, and he can make something beautiful out of it if we are willing to call upon his name and follow and love him. In Luke chapter 10, we have some New Testament recordings of who Satan is as well. Jesus said, yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. This is the description of when Satan first fell. In verses 1 through 3, he, he has the keys to the pit. Luke 8, 31 says the demons kept begging Jesus at one point when he was casting out demons not to send them to the bottomless pit. That word pit is the word abyssos. It's God's jailhouse, if you will, so to speak. This is where Satan's demons are bound, and we know that some of them are on earth. But we also know that the most nasty ones, for the lack of a better description, are in this, this pit. Now this word is used, this pit word, is used seven times in Revelation, and it refers to those chained demons that are being held captive that were once God's angels, but fell in rebellion with Lucifer or Satan himself. Now, as I mentioned before, do you remember where Christ went when he died on the cross? He actually went to the pit or the abyss or the department or compartment of what we call Hades uh, to make a proclamation there to those who have been faithful to God and those who had not. Well, what was he doing there? First Peter chapter 3 tells us. Christ suffered for our sins once and for all. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring us safely home to God. He suffered physical death. But he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building the boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning uh, in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, verse 21. Which now saves you, not the removal of dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So until Jesus rose from the dead, he went to the pit to proclaim victory over Satan's forces. More affirmation to what this pit is is found in Revelation later in chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. It goes like this. Then I saw the angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain uh, in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years, pointing to the thousand-year reign of Christ. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. But then after that, he has to be released for a little while, and we'll see why when we get to that. But back to chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth trumpet brings the first terror. Let's read through this quickly together. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky, and he, he, was given, he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. So this angel is given, this fallen angel is given the key to the pit. And what do you think he wants to do with it? He wants to let others 
out. But you got to remember who gave it to him. Ultimately, who has the keys? Christ gave it to him. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus said, I am the living one. I died, uh, but I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and the grave. And so he opens it up. Revelation 9, 2, when he opened it up, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace and sunlight and the air turned dark from the smoke. So he unlocks the pit where the fallen angels have been since the rebellion and now all hell literally breaks loose on earth. Jude, which only has one chapter to it, in verses 5 through 7, read like this. I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of the authority God had gave them, but left their place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. These cities were destroyed by fire, serving as a warning of the, lit of the eternal fire of God's judgment. So when this judgment comes, these demonic forces are going to be loosed and the earth is going to be blackened with a spiritual darkness. Again, I think that's part of the reason why you and I innately maybe have a fear of the dark because the dark is represent, representation of evil throughout the scripture. Evil is somewhat hindered today and balanced out by, by light, but it's not going to be then. Verse 3, then the locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. There is a power that is unleashed that John is struggling to try to find the words to, to communicate. I do not believe that these are literal locusts, as some depictions have given, as we're going to see, but it is a description of demonic activity. In John's vision, the locusts move in mass, and they blacken the sky, and they're able to sting like scorpions, and they will serve as a, and swarm the earth as it is black. Verse 4. And they were told not, there is some restriction, they were told not to harm the grass or the plants or the trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So they did not eat vegetation, which is an indication to me these are not real locusts as we know locusts. What did they feed on? Those without the seal of God or the unbelievers. That's what they fed on. Verse 5. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain, like the pain of a scorpion sting. There is torture, but no death for five months. This is the ultimate reaping what you have sown. There is a time limit on sin, but it's shortened so that not everyone is destroyed because there's worse things to experience than death. And Satan knows that. Verse 6. In those days, people will seek death, but they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. There is no relief. This is the ultimate characteristic of hell for eternity. And this is a foretaste of that. Verse 7. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads and faces like human faces. In other words, these, these demons uh, are are powerful, and they are intelligent. Verse 8, they had hair like women's hair, which points to the, it's wording to depict seduction of the day, and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron, and their wings roared like the army of chariots rushing to battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions, they had five, and for five months they had the power to torment these people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit, which we already read. This is a description of the seductiveness of Satan. But he has these teeth that will rip you apart. We are warned in the New Testament and other places like 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that Satan is like a roaring lion going, roaming the earth, seeking whom he may devour. Now here's a big question, and I've been asked this many times. How could God let something like this happen? I mean, it's, here, here's what we've got to remember. It's not like God hasn't tried since the beginning to reach those who have been engulfed in sin. What God is doing here is God is simply letting man have what he has ultimately chosen all along. Life without him. And he's saying this is what it looks like. So we come to the second one, verse 12 of chapter 9. 
the first terror has passed, but look, two more terrors are coming. In Revelation 9, verses 13 and 14, this is the sixth trumpet that brings the second terror. This, this, then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the golden altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice said to the angel, sixth angel who held the trumpet, release the four angels who are now bound, fallen angels, that when Satan began to do his work, at the great Euphrates River. This is the voice of Jesus. The golden altar represents the incense. Christ prayed on behalf of man. He's our intercessor. He is our mediator, which was burnt by priests. He is our high priest. But now we have this picture of Christ. The Euphrates River, by the way, is where Eden was and Babylon was. Revelation 9, verse 15. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour uh, and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one-third of all the people on earth. And I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. And in my vision, I saw the horses and riders sitting on them. The riders were, wore armor that was fiery red and dark blue and yellow. The horses had heads like lion, and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. One-third of all the people on earth were killed by these three plagues by the fire and the smoke and the burning sulfur that came out of the mouths of these horses. Their power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes and power to injure people. What a description this is, beyond imagination. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. Amazing. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that can either see or hear or walk. And they did not repent of the murders uh, and of their witchcraft and of their sexual immorality and of their thefts. And there you have it, chapter 9. You know what's really interesting about the fact that when John wrote this and he talks about this army of 200 million, do you know that there weren't even 200 million people on the planet wasn't even close to that when John wrote this. This is beyond all description. Interestingly enough today, you and I are part of the first generation that have seen multiple co countries with the power and the ability to man a 200, man, uh, 200 million man army. China, of course, could do it easily. The United States, if we call up everyone who is, ineligible, who is eligible, can certainly do that a a as well. Because we are preparing and getting prepared for this event, it is a setup. And yet, with all that we see going on in the world, man does not repent. Friends, I don't know what you think about the times that we are living in. I don't know what you think about the fact that uh, we live in a strange period of time, particularly in, in 2020. Here's what I do know. I do know that we've had a record, record number of earthquakes on record this year. I also know that right now, as I'm presently speaking, there are five uh, lined up tropical storms, particularly hurricanes. It's never happened in recorded history of hurricanes. I also know that the, the, the west of the United States is being engulfed. Millions and millions of acres and homes and buildings are being burned to the ground right now through fire. And then, of course, COVID-19. 190, 200,000 people in the United States alone and millions worldwide. Listen, I don't know what all that means. Is that coincidental? Or is it, could, could it be the fact that God is trying to give us, use this evil that he did not cause, but use it to wake us up? As he said in the last days, these things will be like birth pains on a woman. There will be an intensity and a frequency, and there will be an exponential curve going up to try to warn us that something is about to happen. And yet, Man does not repent. So the question for you and I, are we willing to repent, which means to change? Are we willing to look at the world through a different worldview, a godly worldview? I want to challenge you, if you have never accepted Christ, to consider it maybe for the first time or to turn back to what you were taught when you were young, the truth. Friends, it is our only hope. It is our only hope. And I want to encourage you, if you have not had anyone to talk about this, feel free to contact us, and we would love to have a conversation and pray with you about your personal walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you so humbled today. This is a, a frightening passage of Scripture about what is trying to be described in the best words possible, of what the terror that is to come. 
And we know and we're grateful that we, as your followers, will be taken out of this world for that. And I, I thank you for that promise, that we are saved from the wrath to come. But it's coming. And there's so many people around us, Lord, that, that have kicked against you for so long, refused and held you at arm's distance. I, I pray, God, that for a softening of spirit, for anyone who's hearing my voice and watching this today and hearing your word, that, Lord, that you would soften their spirit to say, you know what, maybe my way isn't working so well. Maybe the path that I have chosen is the one that, that, that God would, would not honor. And is it possible that, Father, you're going to give us, what you're going to allow us to reap what we have sown? So may we think about and reflect on what we're sowing into our lives on this day. Thank you for this moment that we have of, uh, of personal examination, and I pray that it is fruitful and beneficial to all of us as we move toward a great day of being with you. Thank you for that confidence. Thank you for that hope that now there is no condemnation for those of us who belong to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I know. 
Yeah. 